Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is supported by Satellite Healthcare, and we thank them for their support. My name is Molly Alawade, and I'm the Director of Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Before I turn the presentation over to today's speaker, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screens. All participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled Questions. We'll see your questions and we'll do our best to answer them, either by replying to you in the questions box or out loud during the last several minutes of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website, kidneyfund.org slash webinars, within the next one to two weeks. For those of you in attendance who are health professionals, we are glad that you've joined us today and hope you'll recommend this webinar to the patients you work with. However, as a friendly reminder, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credits. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer you credits for attending this webinar, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. Without further ado, allow me to introduce today's speaker, Lori Martinez Hassett. Lori has been a registered dietitian since 1996. She joined Satellite Healthcare in 2002 and has worked in one of Satellite's larger home dialysis programs, Wellbound of Emeryville, since it opened in 2005. Her nutrition career and interest in diabetes started well before her professional career when a beloved aunt living with type 1 diabetes taught her the art of carb counting and introduced her to an insulin pump. Thank you, Lori, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, so today, I would like to review um, some common nutrition-related labs that, are, that we monitor in pe people with kidney disease um, and people on dialysis and discuss how it relates to your diet and food choices. Um, I also want to review how kidney disease may impact blood sugars and possible adjustments um, you might discuss with your doctor. And last but not least, um, we will review weight changes that uh, result because of kidney disease. Uh, next slide, please. So food frustration is real. These things that I hear from my patients um, what can I eat? I can't have that, it's not on the list. Can you just give me a meal plan to follow? Um, we as providers, uh, we give our patients these printed education materials and they often contain lists of food and they can be very overwhelming or seem very black and white. I can have this, but I can't have that. And honestly, I have mixed emotions about these food lists. They are great as a reference to have at home on your fridge or on your inside of your cupboard door. However, I always remind my patients that these recommendations are printed on paper. They're not etched in stone. And while there are specific guidelines that um, we give our patients based on the best outcomes. It's also important to keep in mind that people have different nutrition needs. Uh, next slide, please. So there is no one renal diet. Um, nutrition needs differ from person to person, and they might differ depending on the stage of kidney disease. Um, there are some common restrictions. Um, we often restrict potassium and phosphorus and sodium, um, but we do individualize things as much as possible. So um, the information that follows is in general, and please talk to your doctor about a referral to a dietitian. I'd like to remind everyone that Medicare does cover nutrition education for both diabetes and kidney disease, and there's a lot of education programs out there. So ask your doctor if he knows of a class that um, he, could he or she could refer you to. Next slide, please. So focusing first on the three Ps of kidney nutrition, uh, protein, potassium, and phosphorus. 
these last two are often mixed up. I'll be talking to one of my patients about phosphorus, and um, they will tell me, oh, I've cut out bananas and orange juice, which are high in potassium. And then we joke and say, well, that's the other P word. Um, so um, just a bit of self-disclosure here. A family friend of mine recent told me, recently told me about his decline in kidney function. And the next time we got together, we discussed those three Ps and actually the rest of the slides that follow. So I'd like to dedicate this to him, actually. With the next slide here, let's talk about the function of protein. Um, protein is needed for good health. We, we need protein to grow our hair and nails and build and repair muscles and connective tissue heal wounds, uh, we need protein to make hormones and enzymes, and we need protein to make antibodies to fight infections. So in fact, when our protein levels in our blood are low, we will see more infections and hospitalizations in our patients, which we want to avoid. Next slide. So as far as the protein in our diet, um, we, we're all probably aware of the protein from animal sources, meat, fish, chicken, eggs, milk. And this is what we refer to in the renal nutrition world as the high biological value protein. It contains all the amino acids um, needed to make a complete protein. Um, there's also good quality protein from plant-based sources, our vegetables, um, that are high in protein are the beans, lentils, nuts, seeds. Um, there's a small amount of protein in grains, cereals, breads, and pastas as well. And often, um, you might have heard in the past, if you're following a plant-based diet or a vegetarian diet, you combine the beans and the grain to make a complete protein. So um, you can still get enough protein in a plant-based diet. Next slide. So in terms of the protein in our diet, we want to eat enough, but not too much. Um, many people with diabetes spill protein into their urine, um, which is referred to as protein urea. Protein is not meant to be in the urine. So if we're eating more protein, that's just placing an added burden on the kidneys. And the higher the level of protein in the urine is associated with a faster decline in the kidney function. So this is something you can talk to your doctor about and ask him um, what, the, what your protein level in your urine is. It's part of the routine testing that all doctors do for people with diabetes. Um, symptoms you might see at home is just bubbly, foamy urine. That's protein, protein in your urine. Next slide. As kidney disease progresses, it often becomes challenging to eat enough protein and calories in general. Um, common symptoms people start experiencing are often subtle at first, maybe just a decreased appetite, things uh, patients tell me food tastes funny or they have a funny taste in their mouth or a metallic taste and they don't feel like eating. As kidney disease progresses, people might have symptoms of nausea and vomiting um, or it might just be very subtle like decreased energy which makes it harder to shop and cook. Um, it's hard to do those things when you have no energy. So not only do we monitor labs, but we also look at symptoms. Um, we want to keep both in mind when we're deciding if someone needs to start dialysis. Uh, next slide. So some challenges to um, so we talked about protein in the diet. Now I want to talk about protein in the blood. Um, adequate, <clears throat> uh, 
we need adequate protein in our diet to maintain the blood, uh, the protein in our blood, which is called albumin. And if you look at a lab, um, uh, your lab results, it will have a target range of about three and a half to five. Four is ideal. Um, the lower the albumin level, the more risk of infections and hospitalizations people have. Um, it also becomes a bit of a vicious cycle because if people have infections and surgeries and are in an inflammatory state, that will also contribute to low albumin levels. Um, and fluid retention can actually contribute to low albumin levels, which, which we'll discuss later. So if you eat meat, um, about half of your protein should come from high biological value protein, and this is your meat, your chicken, your fish. Um, like we said before, the vegetarian diets are also healthy, um, and that protein from um, beans and lentils and nuts is, is fine, but just a side note, it does contain some potassium and phosphorus. And we'll discuss that in just a little bit. Um, so this is where it's good to consult with a dietitian um, if you're following a plant-based diet or want to include more plant-based meals in your diet. Next slide. So protein recommendations. Um, you'll be surprised to know for you know stage three and four when we're saying to eat less protein. This is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram, and the next slides will give an example of how much that is. But um, that is actually consistent with what the recommended daily intake for all Americans. This is what we've, the USDA has been recommending for everyone. So honestly, we've probably been eating more protein than we actually need. Um, when someone is on dialysis, we do encourage them to eat more protein, about 1.2 to 1.3 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, and that's because they're losing protein in the dialysis process. So next slide, examples of uh, protein recommendations. If you're a smaller person, say 135 pounds, and to add a healthy weight for your height, that would be just about 50 grams of protein a day. And remember half of that from the um, high biological value sources, that's only four ounces, four ounces a day. Um, whereas on dialysis, um, that might be a little bit more, about six ounces of protein a day. Next slide. For a larger person, let's say you're 200 pounds at a healthy weight for your height, um, that could be five to six ounces of protein a day before, um, this is pre-dialysis, and up to eight to nine ounces of protein a day um, if you're on dialysis. And I want to take it just a second here before going on to the next slide. Um, if you visualize a plate, and what is a serving of protein? We often use the palm of our hand or the deck of cards as a three ounce serving. So um, six ounces a day would be like two decks of cards for the whole day, whereas on dialysis, maybe up to three decks of cards worth of protein for the whole day. Um, next slide, please. So moving on to potassium. Uh, potassium is um, needed to help the muscles and nerves work together, work correctly. Um, either a high potassium level or a low potassium level can be dangerous and affect your heart. So healthy kidneys will keep that potassium level balanced in the blood. If you eat more, your kidneys will just manage it and um, you'll you'll eliminate more potassium through your urine. But when the kidneys aren't working, those potassium levels may go up. And 
we don't know at what point they might go up um, to a high level that could be dangerous, which is where some of those potassium restriction recommendations come from. Next slide. So causes of changes in potassium. Um, one, the decline in kidney function. Um, as the kidneys remove less, less waste products, those, um, those potassium levels go up. Um, if you're having GI problems like not eating well or vomiting or diarrhea, you might have a low potassium level. There are all sorts of medications that are commonly used in people with diabetes and kidney disease to control blood pressure and and remove excess fluid, and some of them will cause you to lose more potassium and create lower potassium levels, whereas some of them might cause slightly higher potassium levels. Um, there are salt substitutes. People have gotten the message that they need to cut back on salt, and they might buy something like Morton Light or New Salt, and that contains potassium chloride. Um, so generally, we recommend not using these um, salt substitutes. Now, something like Mrs. Dash, an herbal blend, is fine. But if it looks like salt and it's made with potassium chloride, we want to avoid that. Um, your food choices will affect the potassium in your blood. And I work in dialysis where we have a lot of patients on peritoneal dialysis. And this type of dialysis, um, we tend to see lower potassium levels in our patients because the, the dialysis process itself is done every day and it just removes quite a bit of potassium. So someone who's been on a potassium restriction and then chooses this type of dialysis suddenly has to um, learn to eat more potassium. Next slide. So with potassium, we want to eat enough, but not too much. Um, potassium is found mainly in our fruits and vegetables, but it's also in some of the foods that are high in phosphorus, which we'll get to in a minute, like the beans and lentils, nuts, milk products. Uh, we do recommend five servings a day of various fruits and vegetables, give or take. Um, we want a nice, well-rounded, healthy diet. And the serving sizes are similar to what you've um, learned about diabetic exchanges, those half cup portions or, you know, four ounces of juice or a piece of fruit the size of a light bulb is about 15 grams of carbohydrate. Um, the non-starchy vegetables may be only five grams of carbohydrate per serving. Next slide. So here are some of the higher potassium foods. I know a lot of people are familiar with oranges and bananas and tomatoes and potatoes. Um, the foods I put on this list are the highest of the high. So coconut water is a great source of potassium, and that's all over those stores these days. Um, in California, we have persimmons in season. There's uh, on the trees all over the place. Pomegranates are high in potassium. Your tomatoes and potatoes and potatoes in all its different forms, potato chips, french fries, hash browns, um, your dark squashes, um, these are all high in potassium. Next slide, please. Okay, the lower potassium foods um, are going to be your apples, cranberries, uh, the blueberries, raspberries, grapes. Um, cranberry juice is a good substitute for orange juice if someone likes a little bit of juice in the morning. Cranberry juice is much lower. Um, from the vegetable standpoint, your green beans, cabbage, corn, carrots, cucumbers, eggplant, these are all lower in potassium. Um, so you can see the frustration with both lists. You know, some of the foods aren't on, 
are on one list and not the other or might not be on the list. And those foods tend to be still contain potassium, but they're probably on a medium potassium list. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of monitoring potassium, um, the levels can change um, depending on you know, how you're eating or what medicines you're taking. Um, or what type of dialysis you end up doing if, if you get to the point where you need dialysis. Either too high or too low is dangerous. Um, symptoms of high um, potassium are often irregular heartbeats or muscle weakness, symptoms patients have told me. Um, the lab target, about three and a half to five, similar to albumin, so think of the four as being nice and uh, right, right in the middle there. Um, consult with your doctor. Ask your doctor what your potassium level is, um, you know, and do you need to cut back on potassium? Um, not everyone has high potassium, and, you know, we often assume, you know, we need to restrict potassium, but I have had a patient surprise me and come with low potassium and actually need to be on potassium supplements. So it is very individualized. Next slide, please. So the last P word, um, phosphorus. Um, phosphorus and calcium are minerals that keep our bones and our teeth strong. And healthy kidneys will keep the phosphorus and calcium balanced in the blood. So again, as kidney function declines, the phosphorus levels go up, and that will contribute to weak bones. Minerals literally come out of the bones, and they start depositing in the heart, and the blood vessels, and the soft tissues. Um, this is, you know, and this can contribute to um, heart, heart problems, heart disease, heart, heart attacks. Next slide, please. The phosphorus in our diet is prevalent. It's everywhere. It's often in the proteins. It's mostly in the protein foods, your animal meat protein. So again, we want to eat enough protein, but not too much. Um, you will see lists of high phosphorus foods that include dried beans, nuts, legumes, um, it's also in meat, cheese, yogurt, and anything made with milk products. Um, but I want to really emphasize the processed foods, the fast foods, the cola drinks, because these are the ones that contain inorganic phosphates, and these are additives that contain phosphorus. Um, examples of these would be your frozen entrees, deli meats, processed meats like sausage and ham and uh, salami, uh, baking mixes contain these inorganic phosphates. Um, next slide, please. So why I want to emphasize these inorganic phosphates is because um, they are very well absorbed. Your body will absorb about 90% or more of the phosphorus from these food additives, and they're not on the nutrition facts label, so you have to search for them in the ingredient list, and you want to look for FOS, P-H-O-S, in the word. So in Coke or Pepsi, this might be phosphoric acid. In baking powder and baked goods, it might be in the form of monocalcium phosphate. Um, the animal protein, only 50% of the phosphorus in the animal sources of your meat, chicken, and fish um, is absorbed. And poor beans, they're so healthy, they get on these um, high phosphorus lists, but they are full of nutrition, and they are, are, they are high in phosphorus, but only 40% of that phosphorus is absorbed. So there is room for some of that in our diets. 
Now, again, looking at these labels, um, it's very hard to read them. Sometimes uh, with my eyesight these days, I have to take a picture of them and blow it up on my phone. But next slide, please. Here you can see, um, or it is hard to see, but there in the ingredient list is sodium aluminum phosphate and monocalcium phosphate. And these are uh, leavening agents in um, the baking mixes. Um, there's also phosphorus added to fast food to make the French fries look more crispy golden brown. Um, you know, so it's very prevalent in our diet. And just getting back to cooking with fresh ingredients can do a lot to reduce the phosphorus in our diet. Challenging, but it can be done. Um, next slide, please. So monitoring phosphorus. Changes in phosphorus happen early in kidney disease, and these higher levels lead to the weak bones and calcification. Um, in general, our phosphorus target is about you know, three and a half to five and a half. Um, earlier in kidney disease, we, we try to keep it a little bit lower. Um, there's some thoughts now of like what is ideal, is five and a half even a little bit too high? Um, so again, I tell my patients, let's shoot for the fours or at least less than five and a half. Next slide, please. Um, managing phosphorus is challenging. There's very few symptoms, and it's very prevalent in many foods, as we discussed. And the high levels are linked with very poor outcomes. There's a higher risk of fractures because of the weakened bones, and then the heart calcification that leads to heart problems and even early death. Um, so we want to restrict the phosphorus in our diet as much as possible. I think the biggest thing for your buck is to um, cut back on those um, inorganic phosphates and keep your portions of um, milk and cheese to a minimum. Um, there's diet and then medication or drugs is the other D. Um, in dialysis, we will often prescribe phosphate binders with the meals, and these are pills that you take with your food to bind the phosphorus, and it's um, eliminated through the GI tract, and your blood phosphorus level doesn't rise as high when you take these medicines. Um, and then there's dialysis for those who need dialysis. So. I, I refer to the three Ds, diet, drugs, and dialysis, with my patients as the trifecta. We have to figure out the combination of all three that, that gives you the best phosphorus management. Next slide, please. So in review, protein or albumin, when it's the protein in our blood, um, it's important we need it to stay healthy and fight infection. We want to avoid excess protein in the diet and eat enough, but not too much. There are medications that help manage proteinuria. Um, there's what we call the ACE inhibitors and ARBs that are also adding a protective effect for the heart. Um, that then going to potassium, this can affect your heart rhythm. If the blood levels are high, then we want to restrict those high potassium foods. If the blood levels are low, then we want to eat more high potassium foods. But as we are going through those lists of potassium-containing foods, you are probably aware that a lot of those contain carbohydrates. So when I'm telling people to eat more high potassium foods, I always think of not only the um, the fruits, but some of the vegetables that are lower in carbohydrates, so we're not creating a high blood sugar situation by eating more high potassium foods. 
uh, regarding phosphorus. It does affect our bone and our heart health. And the food choices, um, you know, some of these food choices that we've been uh, recommending to people with diabetes um, all these years might be high in phosphorus. Um, I remember working with patients with diabetes and, you know, we'd often say, well, have some cheese for a snack or a little bit of milk at bedtime. That was one of the things my aunt used to take to drink to keep her blood sugars more stabilized throughout the night. Um, we, we've recommended eating more beans because they're high in fiber and nutrition. And now these food sources all, might also be high in phosphorus. So, we got to balance those out. Um, target value, targets for all these um, different nutrients, when you're looking at your labs, just think of the fours. An albumin of four, a potassium in the fours, a phosphorus in the fours. Next slide, please. So switching a little bit from diet and just talking about kidney disease and diabetes, some considerations um, I like to review with um, my patients. Um, A1C is, that's the hemoglobin A1C. It's a routine blood test to look at diabetes management over the last couple of months. Um, so the hemoglobin A1C is, uh, a reflection of the percentage of hemoglobin molecules that have glucose stuck to them. So its accuracy might be affected by anemia. Um, I've had patients with low hemoglobin levels and their A1C looks normal, yet they're having high blood sugars. Um, so it's important to continue to check blood sugars um, our A1C target is 7% um, in, in kidney disease. Um, we ac actually have a li little bit of a liberalized um, A1C target in our company. We, we want to avoid these low blood sugars. So sometimes when you're really trying to have tight blood sugar control, you're at a higher risk or uh, low blood sugar reactions. And so we have a, a tolerance of, you know, up to 8% for that A1C. Uh, next slide, please. So different things to consider. Causes of low blood sugar um, might be due to kidney disease and the symptoms, just not feeling great, decreased appetite, not eating as much. Um, there's also uh, the fact that your kidneys are not clearing waste products. So we talked about how the waste products from food can build up, but that's also true for medication. So um, medication starts staying around longer, um, and the dose of the medication might be changed or a certain meds are discontinued. Um, with kidney disease, um, there's a higher risk um, for low blood sugars. For example, when you're using a long-acting medication for diabetes management, for, for example, gliburide is a common medication. Um, it's been used for years for people with diabetes. Um, and Sometimes it can just be a simple change to a shorter acting version of the same medicine. Um, we, the bottom line, we want to reduce the risk of low blood sugars. So next slide, please. So I'm, I put on this slide some different um, classes of medicine and um, I am by no means an expert in all the latest medicines, but that's a, that's a whole different talk by itself. But I do want to bring these up because I see patients coming in and some of them are on these different medicines. So like the sulfonylureas, like glipizide and gliburide we just talked about, 
um, the glipizide dose might be decreased, or if you're on a long-acting version of this medicine, it can be decreased, um, or it can be changed to a short-acting version of the, of the same medicine. Um, insulin is often, the dose can be decreased. Um, metformin or glucophage, this is one of those medications that's often stopped as the as the GFR decreases or the creatinine starts going up with the progression of the kidney disease. Um, the TZDs, the glitazones, the actos um, are often stopped in advanced kidney disease. Um, There's some new classes of medications that are pretty exciting. They, they have a much lower risk of low blood sugar. They can help with weight loss. and there's a lot of great data out there that show there's a decreased risk of heart problems and cardiovascular death. Um, but these are, again, are not used with advanced kidney disease. Although I have seen some people on them and, you know, before they needed dialysis and they were very effective um, in helping with weight loss. Next slide, please. Um, some other considerations, um, the type of dialysis one chooses. Um, if you get to the point where you need dialysis, um, there's a peritoneal dialysis um, where we put solution in a uh, dialysate solution in the abdomen. Um, and this is done at home, and that solution does contain dextrose, which is sugar, and that may affect blood sugars. Um, but that is not a reason to not choose this type of dialysis should you need to do the dialysis. Um, we have about 90 patients here, and I'm, I'm here to tell you about half of them on PD have diabetes. So um, it's not preventing them from doing this type of dialysis. Um, we will adjust medication or insulin as needed depending on their blood sugar trends. Next slide, please. So moving on to weight changes that occur due to kidney disease. Um, kidney disease, re or kidneys remove both waste products and fluid. So as the kidney function declines, that fluid can build up and cause weight gain. Um, now, there can be some weight loss also. Um, weight products increase and cause symptoms that, um, like we've talked about, the taste changes, nausea, the decreased appetite, and uh, sometimes people have gained fluid weight, but they've lost some, some weight because of these symptoms. So it becomes a little bit tricky to sort out what the weight changes um, are from. Next slide, please. So we look at dry weight versus fluid weight. And dry weight is your lean mean weight without extra fluid retention. Um, so there's no swelling, there's no shortness of breath, um, your blood pressures are better controlled, and these changes in dry weight occur slowly. The dry weight is not really affected by the dialysis. Okay. Next slide. Conversely, fluid weight, um, the fluid weight gain is due to retaining fluid. Uh, the clearance of the kidneys from the kidneys decreases, and basically people start peeing less. Um, and this becomes worse. You will retain more fluid if you have a high salt intake or a high fluid intake. I've had patients tell me, well, my kidneys aren't working. Shouldn't I be drinking more fluid to flush them out? Um, won't that help? And 
sometimes, no, that does not help at all. We, we want to not um, take in more fluid than what our kidneys are able to process. So often we have some fluid restrictions. Um, symptoms of fluid, of fluid retention would be swelling, shortness of breath, rapid weight changes, um, elevated heart, um, elevated blood pressures. Um, so anytime you have symptoms like this, you want to report that to your doctor, especially if it's new, because that fluid weight that people carry around is an, is an added strain on the heart and can lead to congestive heart failure. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the diet, sodium plays a big role. There is salt everywhere. Um, we want to limit our sodium intake to 2,000 milligrams a day and really read those food labels. We want to look for things that, products that have no added salt or low sodium. Um, reduced sodium is the next best, but it might still be high in sodium. For instance, soy sauce. There's, uh, low, there's reduced sodium soy sauce. However, it is not low in sodium. It still contains plenty of sodium. It just contains less than regular soy sauce. Um, cooking at home with, with fresh ingredients is one of the best ways um, to cut back the sodium in our diet. About 75% of the sodium in our diet is from processed foods. So when eating out, you know, ask for no added salt or dressing on the side, avoid soups and things that um, have lots of sauces on them. Um, look at your condiments at home and, you know, check and see how much sodium is really in, uh, is in that uh, condiment that you're using. Are you, is there one that you can substitute? Um, I've become a big fan of balsamic vinegar. It contains absolutely no sodium, and it can be used to make things taste delicious. Um, next slide, please. So the less sodium, the better. We recommend 2,400. Uh, the food labels are, say, 2,400 milligrams for all Americans. So that 2,000 milligrams a day is pretty close to the, what the food labels recommend. One teaspoon contains a whole day's allotment of, of sodium. Um, what's pictured there is a quarter teaspoon, what they say a serving size is, which is 560 milligrams, um, according to this food label. Um, I have had people tell me that it's, um, it's sea salt or it's Himalayan pink salt. It's lower in sodium. And if it's a difference of 10 or 20 milligrams, um, that's not really significant. Salt is salt is salt, whether it comes from the sea or it comes from the Himalayas. <laughs> Less is better. Next slide, please. Um, talking again about weight and uh, benefits of weight loss. So with diabetes, one of the first line therapies we recommend is the TLC, the therapeutic lifestyle changes. And that's, you know, diet and exercise. Just decreasing your body weight by 10% can make a big difference in your blood sugar management. The heavier we are, the more insulin resistant we become. Um, and then exercise helps improve um, our blood sugar management and increases insulin sensitivity so the insulin that is available works more efficiently. With diet and exercise, we see not only improved blood sugars, but improved blood pressures. Um, if transplant is your end goal, it's important to know that most centers require a, that your weight be in a healthy range, um, a BMI or a body mass index less than 35 is 
what's recommended. Now, to go back to those body mass index charts, remember 25, um, anything over a BMI of 25 is what we consider overweight, and anything over 30 is actually obese. So, you know, a BMI of 35 or less, it, you don't have to be rail thin to get a transplant. You, you can still be a little bit overweight and still, still qualify for transplants. But anything higher than a BMI, um, there's a higher risk with the surgery and a not as good of outcomes. So, you know, working on a healthy weight um, for transplant is, is always encouraged. Next slide, please. So in review, kidney disease um, affects the clearance of fluid, and there will be some sodium and fluid restrictions um, for most, most patients. It also affects the clearance of nutrients, and we often have restrictions for potassium and phosphorus. Um, kidney disease can affect hemoglobin. Anemia is common, which in turn may may um, change the a A1C results and skew them perhaps a little bit. So it's important to continue to monitor your blood sugar. Um, kidney disease will also affect the clearance of medications. So dosing might be changed or decreased or stopped altogether. Um, just please talk to your doctor if you're having low blood sugars rather than stopping insulin or stopping your medicine altogether because sometimes when we stop altogether, then your blood sugars will swing the other direction. Um, so <clears throat> uh, good to keep in communication and to ask um, if you have questions about some of your lab values. Uh, next slide, please. Well, that is it. Um, I appreciate you having me. Well, thank you again, Lori. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and for leading such an excellent webinar. So at this time, I'd like to ask you to answer a few questions we've received over the course of the webinar. So number one, how is zucchini or summer squash regarding potassium? Are there differences when they are raw versus when they're cooked? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm going from memory. The summer squash tends to be on the low to medium side of um, potassium as far as high in potassium or low in potassium. It tends to be low, low to medium. Um, and I don't know about uh, the potassium content after cooking it. I know some of the other vegetables like potatoes, the, I've seen um, instructions on dialyzing your potatoes where you cut the potatoes up and soak them in water and that actually leaches out some of the potassium and then you dump all the water out and cook them. Um, so I'm not sure how well other vegetables would stand up to that process though. Good point. Okay, um, our next question is, how is phosphorus listed on a blood test? I see alkaline phosphatase. Is that phosphorus? Uh, no, phosphorus is actually listed as phosphorus. Um, the alkaline phosphatase actually is part of those uh, bone-related labs that we do look at in dialysis, um, but I've noticed on some of the metabolic panels, you have to add phosphorus onto it. So that would be one, if you don't see a phosphorus result on your labs, to ask your doctor what it is or it's, um, it can be ordered. Great advice. Okay, so our next question is, as a diabetic, should I watch out for the sugar found in some of the low potassium fruits? Um, with diabetes, um, it, you know, depending on the type of therapy you're doing, we want to keep um, you know, the carb content moderate at meals. However, there's some people that do um, 
multiple daily injections and can adjust the insulin based on their carbohydrate intake. So if they are eating more carbohydrate, they can dose their insulin to cover that additional um, that additional carb. Um, okay. I, uh, Right, I'm sorry. Not sure. Did I answer that question? No, I think so, definitely. Um, our next question, also diet related, um, what are your thoughts on juicing? Oh, goodness. Um, mixed feelings on juicing. Um, I mentioned I live or I work in, Paris, in uh, home dialysis, and we have a lot of PD patients, and rarely do I see high potassium levels in my PD patients. There are some few exceptions. And often one of the time one of the times I see these higher potassium levels is when someone's gotten um, the Vitamix and has started juicing. <laughs> so if you are juicing, I would recommend looking at these uh, food list and choosing the very lowest in potassium, like your cucumbers, um, and uh, keeping the portions small. Mm, that makes sense. Okay, so our next question is, do you have food recommendations for someone with mid-stage kidney disease and high blood sugar? Um, I would, so CKD, like stage, Three or four and high blood yeah. sugar. Mm -hmm. So I would work with your doctor or diabetes educator to see, you know, how we can get that blood sugar better managed, number one. Um, and then what I often tell my patients is just go back to basics with your protein, starch, vegetable on your plate, try to have a balanced diet, a little bit of protein, moderate amount of carbohydrate, um, and some, some sort of fruit and vegetable to have a nice balanced diet. But as far as managing the blood sugar, there's so many different things that affect blood sugar, you know, your diet, your medication or insulin timing. Um, so I, I would recommend working with your, you know, with a diabetes educator. Um, if your doctor is not, you know, specializing in diabetes, ask for a referral to, to a diabetes education program or endocrinologist. Okay. Um, our next question is, it's too hard to manage sugar, sodium, protein, phosphorus, and potassium all at once. Which one should I prioritize managing? <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, which is the biggest problem? I um, Honestly, um, oh, well, maybe take a look at your labs with your doctor. And, um, you know, if there are certain labs that are very high, we want to focus on, on those. Um, you know, uh, Controlling the blood sugar is, you know, going to help um, help decrease the um, help stave off the progression of the kidney disease. Same with the protein urea. You know, if if we can cut back on the protein and um, not and decrease the amount of protein in your urine, that might help. Um, with slowing the progression of the kidney disease. Um, but I, again, would refer people to talk to their doctor about what are their biggest issues for them at that moment. You know, is it a heart problem where you're retaining more fluid or are the blood sugars very, very hard to control? Is the phosphorus an issue at this point? Um, and kind of strategize from there. Yeah, that's great advice. Okay, so our next question is, if I'm pre-dialysis, should I stop taking protein powder after the gym? 
You know, the protein powders often have a lot of additives in them, and they can have calcium and phosphorus, and I've seen some with potassium added in them. And if you can get an adequate amount of protein in your diet and really don't need those addition, the additional protein from a protein powder, I would start with diet first. Um, you know, and again, you know, how much protein does one need? Do you really need that extra protein powder, um, you know, after exercise um, if you're able to get it in your diet? Um, now, it, when I'm talking to some of my dialysis patients and they have low protein levels, then we often do um, use different protein supplements. And when we are using protein supplements, we look for the ones that have no added calcium, no added phosphorus in them, or as little as possible. Great. Um, so our next question is, can I relax my diet a bit if I take all my medications and exercise a little? I guess that would depend on your lab values. Um, in, you know, sometimes when we, we relax a little bit, those blood sugars are, go up a little bit, or our blood pressure might go up a little bit if we're eating too much salt, and we tend to be salt sensitive. So, um, again, I would refer to the doctor, and I, I, I don't mean to, you know, put all the burden on you and your doctor talking, but um, it's, it's good to know what are the biggest issues that you have going on at the moment. Is it your blood pressure and getting that under control? Um, honestly, I'm, I will tell you if um, my patients have great blood pressure control and they're telling me they have something that was high in sodium, I don't admonish them. Um, I commend them on having good blood pressure control because ultimately that's what's best for your heart. Right, absolutely. So our next question, kind of in the similar vein of the juicing question, is a vegan diet recommended for those with kidney disease? There are a lot of studies that show some benefits to a plant-based diet. Um, and it can be done healthfully. It does take a little bit of planning, and um, you want to keep, keep in mind what your lab values are. So that would be something to review with your doctor or dietitian. Um, but um, yes, there, is, there are some benefits to the plant-based diet, definitely. Okay, great. Um, so an, another question, uh, with all of these restrictions, I feel like I don't eat enough. I'm always hungry. What should I do? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, high fiber foods, um, make sure you're including, you know, again, a well-balanced diet with um, fruits and vegetables and adding some fiber there because that will add to the satiety and um, you know, sometimes we actually need a little bit of fat um, in our diets. We cut back and we cut back, and um, sometimes fat can be useful to add a little bit of calories for those who need those extra calories, um, and it helps with satiety, um, that feeling of fullness. Um, it's hard to just restrict, 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 and feel hungry all the time. Um, so. Another thing I talk to people about when, you know, they're trying to lose weight is food's just often one part of the equation. Um, sometimes it's, you know, how our relationship with food. Um, are we eating when we're happy? Are we eating when we're sad? Um, do you, you know, paying attention to those hunger and satiety cues um, is also important. And we really appreciate you, Lori. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so this concludes today's webinar. Uh, we will have another webinar next week, or next month, sorry, on anxiety and kidney disease. Um, this webinar will be held on Thursday, December 13th, and hosted by licensed clinical social worker, Chastity Shugart. Registration is open now. Uh, please visit kidneyfund.org webinars for more information and to register. When the webinar closes, 
please do not close your browser window. You may see a pop-up saying that the webinar has ended. Please close that pop-up and proceed to the webinar evaluation survey. Your honest feedback will help us make our webinar program the best it can be. Thank you for joining and we hope to see you again.